Welcome back. Let's get started with our final session before a brief uh, summary session that we have. We're going to talk about industrial applications and opportunities for, for hydrogen. We have uh, three speakers who are steeped into this area. Brett Foreman from the Center for Houston's Future, Jack Grudo from Dow, and Christian Athray from ExxonMobil. Jack, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. When you and I had conversation about this roundtable uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, it led to some you know, very good questions and how great the opportunities are, but then also how deep the challenges and the scale are. And the scale is something that you always remind me of, so I'm very excited to hear what you have to share with us. Over to you, Jack. Sure, yeah, so for, for Dow, I mean, uh, when we talk about solving these problems, we, we have, uh, you know, pretty large facilities and switching them from uh, methane based to carbon uh, to hydrogen based is going to be challenging. We have, we've done quite a bit of engineering work in Europe initially. Um, I think the big challenge is, I mean, I was listening to the various talks today and people tossed around phrases like um, we can get uh, uh, hydrogen down, you know, blue hydrogen down to $100 a megawatt. That's $10 a million BTU <clears throat> at, at, a, at a 10 heat rate. It's important that people understand that there's a competitiveness issue here and that the, there's been huge investment in the United States in the last decade because of shale and low cost natural gas. And um, uh, the uh, if we do this right, we'll be able to maintain that competitiveness. And if we don't do it right, that'll be a challenge for a, for a US uh, investment going forward. It'll be a challenge for the whole shift to a hydrogen economy because um, uh, other economies will take away jobs and take away opportunity. So let's go to the next slide and, uh, and look at sort of what we see happening. So, you know, transitioning at scale, we have, we have about seven gigawatts globally of power and steam that we uh, generate and utilize. Um, uh, almost, uh, well, virtually all of that's generated using natural gas. And then we have uh, various feedstocks that we run through our uh, ethylene plants. Um, we have about uh, 50 uh, uh, gas and steam uh, turbines globally, um, over 100 furnaces, and uh, 30 major sites that are producing all these various products. So that just gives you an idea of the scale. Um, we use about a, a million barrels a day of feedstock, and um, uh, so that's kind of just give you a feel for uh, the scale of what uh, the challenge is going to be for us. Um, next slide. So we we done quite a bit of engineering in Europe, and and clearly blue hydrogen is uh, is the is the best alternative. And we studied both pre-combustion and post-combustion. And we've talked to Shell and the various people you've had on the call here about various ways of doing that. Um, obviously, you have to have some method of generating your hydrogen. From, uh, from methane initially, um, green hydrogen is a longer putt, uh, not the least of, small, not the smallest problem of which is, uh, you know, getting water clean enough to make green hydrogen that requires very high uh, purity water um, to make that uh, uh, effective and, and, and water supply in parts of Europe is also an issue. So green hydrogen is, a, is, a, is farther out the horizon right now as far as we can tell. Um, we think blue hydrogen is possible today. Um, also, if you build a, a steam uh, steam methane reformer on your site, if you're making ethylene or you're running a refinery, you can put your off gases into some of these facilities and also convert them to uh, hydrogen. So it makes it a very, very clean operation. So we think that's Gen 1. Um, in Europe, that, that's uh, clearly going to happen for two reasons. You know, people talked about the wherewithal in Canada and the wherewithal happening in Europe. This is happening because of two reasons. One, the Governments have put regulations in place, but also they've come through with major subsidies. And as those subsidies come through, um, then it makes it uh, viable for corporations to continue their competitive position or close to their current competitive position with those subsidies. And that's going to be a challenge in the U.S. because the U.S. doesn't have a history of the subsidy scale that Europe does. Um, and then uh, we think the next stage will be um, uh, retrofitting the power sources. Right now, most of the European subsidies are directed um, toward the uh, chemical plants and refineries and not really directed toward power generation facilities. Um, uh, but we're going to have to have uh, uninterrupted, um, uninterruptible power and uh, intermittent power like you get from most uh, renewable sources is hugely challenging for, uh, for the whole grid. 
Um, but uh, specifically for uh, chemical plants that run 24 hours a day, it's just not acceptable. So we're going to have to have very reliable power. And batteries at scale are just so far out, we don't see it happening in the coming decade at scale that we need. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll retrofit our turbines to, for hydrogen fueling over time. And um, uh, then, of course, if we do have point sources over time, we'll have to go after point sources. Then Gen 3, we would hope would be advanced technology that uh, lowers the cost of green hydrogen so we can begin shifting from blue to green. But we think that's probably uh, 20 to 30 years away. Um, next slide. So these are, you know, where we see uh, the various requirements. The first and foremost is, in the, you know, the, uh, people talk about uh, how important this is, and I don't disagree with that, but consumers are going to have to be willing to pay for these carbon solutions, and they're not going to be cheap. They're either going to come through in the form of the cost of goods, or it's going to come through in the form of higher taxes, but, but some or some combination thereof, but it, it, it will happen. Um, and then uh, on power and steam technology, um, you know, we have carbon neutral technology today, um, and then we need, you know, if we can build uh, uh, blue, convert our, our gas-fired power plants to blue hydrogen, then uh, maybe they can run 24 hours a day. The big challenge we have today with uh, natural gas power, of course, is that um, there's been uh, the subsidies on renewables have made, um, have driven more and more of the continuous sources of power, uh, dispatchable power, to where they don't need to run as many hours of the day, so the cost of power per hour is going up and continuing to rise. And then the CO2 and hydrogen infrastructure, uh, there's been a lot of talking about that. Um, you know, my good friend Gordon did a good job of uh, summarizing what he's doing up in Canada. And, uh, you know, I think these solutions are viable going forward. You know, I'm hopeful that somehow we can figure out um, uh, hydrogen pyrolysis and, and not need to inject all this carbon in the ground with an uncertain future of uh, what happens to it over many, many years. We don't really have the experience to know that as industry yet. And then on process technology, you know, Dow working with other companies is working on various process technology that are, that are more carbon efficient or, or closer to zero carbon using electricity or whatever. But uh, those technologies are also, you know, um, sometime out in the future. Um, we think some in the current coming decade and, um, and then others uh, in the following uh, decade. So I think that's all the slides I had. Is there another slide? No, that's it. Yeah, so that was really really all the comments I was going to make. And if you have questions, obviously, I'm happy to uh, to take them. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. We will have some time for questions at the end. Uh, but let's see if uh, I think Brett has still not been able to join, but we are very close to fixing the technical aspect uh, and get him on. And while we do that, uh, Tristan, if you are on, maybe we can go ahead and get your remarks. Uh, on the discussion, and we can go from there if Brett is able to join after that. Tristan, are you on? Varun, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, well, I'm not going to use slides in the interest of time, so um, I'll just make my remarks now. If you want me to continue now, Varun, right? Yes, Tristan, please go ahead. OK, well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, first of all, to the Energy Institute and the Cockrell School for the invitation uh, to share some thoughts on the applications and opportunities for hydrogen uh, towards the end of what's been a very interesting day. I think I'm going to reinforce a lot of the comments uh, that have come previously. Um, hydrogen, of course, is widely used today. Uh, global market of around 100 million tons per year, a little under 15 percent of that here in the US. Uh, it's supplied today mostly from fossil sources, so natural gas, coal, and some crude oil. And um, it's used almost entirely today in manufacturing. So methanol manufacture, ammonia, and various hydroprocessing steps in refining. That's the state of play today. But of course, the theme uh, of, of this event is really more around hydrogen's potential uses as an energy carrier and um, multiple applications are being researched and trialed and evaluated and we've heard a lot about those during the course of the day. We Just believe hyd hydrogen can play a role. Interrupt in for a second. Do you, do you have uh, your camera on or would you be able to turn it on? Uh, I do have a camera on. Are you not seeing a picture? Uh, no, not at this point. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, it's saying here, turn ca camera is on. I'm not sure whether I've got a, a glitch here in the software. Varun, just for the sake of time, I mean, 
why, why don't I just keep talking? You don't need to be looking at my face anyway, so you're really not missing much. <laughs> Sounds if good. You, if you just keep it on the agenda, or the agenda slide or the panel content slide. Apologies for that glitch there, but again, I'm not using slides. Uh, you don't need to be looking at me. Uh, as I was saying, um, we believe hydrogen can play a role in meeting the significant dual energy challenge ahead of us. That is to supply increasing demand for energy globally while reducing environmental impacts, including greenhouse gas emissions. Um, low carbon hydrogen can be made in a number of ways to do that um, through steam methane reforming coupled with CCS, uh, also low carbon electricity being used to electrolyze water, the two key uh, forms people tend to talk about with respect to low carbon hydrogen. Both of those are going to need policy support to gain further traction. That can come in many flavors. Uh, support for research and development. For example, the Department of Energy's uh, H2 at scale program. And it's great, Varun, to see the, the program up and running now at, at UT uh, late last year. Regulatory and legal frameworks will have to be established as will standards uh, for all parts of the value chain. And as we and others have, have advocated widely, a durable incentive for decarbonization through technology neutral economy wide carbon pricing. We see low carbon hydrogen playing a particular role in those hard to decarbonize sectors uh, and, and also um, where it can leverage its advantage of zero emissions at the point of use. So specifically industrial plants, processes, industrial heat, transportation, particularly at the heavy duty end and heating in general. Not to say other applications aren't and won't uh, develop as well, but th those are the areas where we, we see a particular um, opportunity for hydrogen. Texas is a great place to study energy and the associated infrastructure and integration uh, that, that applies to hydrogen uh, as well. Uh, as has been uh, said a number of times today, uh, Texas already has a significant hydrogen infrastructure, uh, production in the area of around 2 million tons per year, and Texas hosts the majority of around about a thousand mile network uh, in the Gulf Coast region. Uh, the core piece of that being air products line that goes all the way to New Orleans and is now being extended down to Texas City for additional applications. We've also since 2012 had in the region a hydrogen manufacturing operation where blue hydrogen is made and the CO2 is taken and sequestered. In this particular case, uh, down at Port Arthur, the hydrogen going to a refinery and the, the CO2 going to EOR applications. So there's a lot of infrastructure already in place here, coupled with a high concentration of uh, end users and industry and companies that can work with academic institutions on this whole uh, topic of, of today's conference. It's no surprise that uh, part of the hydrogen uh, UT program, as we heard earlier, is going to be looking at the greater Port of Houston area and assessing uh, potential additional opportunities for hydrogen application there. Over in Europe, a similar cluster is starting to take shape. The uh, CCS um, there is referred to as the Port of Rotterdam CO2 Transportation Hub and Offshore Storage Project, uh, better known by the acronym PORTHOS. Uh, we're a participant in that project along with Shell, uh, Air Liquide, Air Products and the Port of Rotterdam Authority. Uh, December last year, FEED was entered into on that project and it has the intent of putting in place infrastructure that would gather uh, emissions from the industrial complex in the greater Port of Rotterdam area. We're also involved with many other companies in the associated or, or, or linked H vision study, which is looking at how to leverage that infrastructure and develop additional uses for hydrogen in the greater port area. There are other similar projects emerging around the world being announced and getting underway. I'll just mention one more uh, in, in the interest of time, and that was Equinor's announced Humber, excuse me, hydrogen to Humber Salt End project. They announced that last year over on the other side of the North Sea in the UK, a large blue hydrogen producing facility, taking uh, natural gas, converting it to hydrogen, sequestering the CO2 and feeding that uh, hydrogen to a number of 
industrial applications in the Humber Estuary. In that particular case, uh, the project's also envisaged from what's been published so far to blend some of that hydrogen into a natural gas stream uh, to feed a uh, natural gas fired power project, which is already up and running on, on natural gas. Clusters like the ones we talked about and others have talked about uh, can serve not only to, to facilitate new sources of, of hydrogen supply and demand, but they can also act as uh, infrastructure facilitators of new technology development. And I'll just close uh, with one um, future example of that. We are working and have worked for several years with a company called Fuel Cell Energy to develop molten carbonate fuel cells. Uh, these take effluent from uh, power plants, etc., and capture, concentrate the CO2 for sequestration, but also generate power and some hydrogen. And we're currently working towards proving that technology at scale uh, through a demo unit at our Rotterdam refinery, again, uh, leveraging that greater Port of Rotterdam area infrastructure. Varun, again, apologies that you couldn't see me, but that'll conclude my remarks for today. Great. Thank you so much, Tristan. A lot's going on with what you all are doing, and, and that is going to have a huge impact on how things play out here in Texas. So we will come back, hopefully, uh, with a few more minutes for a question, but we have been able to get Brett to join us. So let's pull up his slides. I see his slides are up. Brett, welcome. So glad you're able to join, and uh, please, you're ready for your remarks. OK, so if you go to the next slide, I, I have uh, four uh, quick points that I can make. Um, so, so we've been talking about different uh, applications all afternoon, and uh, I just wanted to put um, industrial applications in scale. I mean, today, industrial applications are really the key market for hydrogen. And if you look at what the potential is, and we're just talking about potential, I haven't um, size these markets in terms of what the app, the actual market will be, but if you just look at the potential, um, industrial markets could be quite large. In fact, they could be three times the size of the current industrial market and may likely exceed the potential available market for energy storage, uh, renewable natural gas or, or transportation. And I'll show that in a second. So, so there is a huge opportunity, I think, in the industrial space. Um, what, what that means specifically is that <clears throat> we're going to see hydrogen being used in different ways. It'll be uh, used, uh, today it's used primarily as, as a feedstock in oil refinery and, and chemical manufacturing, uh, but we're likely to see uh, new applications uh, as a zero or low carbon industrial fuel at the, or as an input uh, to an integrated um, new manufacturing process such as in steel manufacturing or perhaps in cement. And um, many of these um, applications really are ones which are considered hard to abate. So in other words, there aren't a, not a lot of other options uh, for decarbonizing these sectors. So hydrogen will play um, an extremely important role, but this will probably take, uh, as others have said, quite a long time because they will require a, um, a, a, re, a new uh, redesign of the existing manufacturing process. Um, and finally, I think uh, the Gulf Coast will be well positioned uh, to be this industrial hydrogen hub, as many have already um, uh, pointed out. We have uh, a lot of the uh, manufacturing facilities and hydro pr hydrogen production. And so perhaps there is even opportunities to attract new industries that we don't have today. Uh, such as the decarbonized steel industry. So if we think broadly about this, and if we uh, we think about what the possibilities are, uh, really, I think in some ways the possibilities could be endless. So let me just kind of walk you through <clears throat> some of the details of each of those points on the next page. So this is um, a page that I took from the uh, US um, uh, Hydrogen Economy Roadmap that the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association did. And it just shows uh, kind of the sources in current industrial applications for the 11 million metric tons of hydrogen today. And as you can see, uh, the primary use of hydrogen today is in refining, uh, primarily in um, desulfurization of petrochemicals. So uh, as has been mentioned, and work that we've done at the center basically has shown that um, the Houston is a huge center for 
um, for uh, the production of hydrogen primarily for uh, these sorts of applications. Uh, you do have applications in ammonia um, and then smaller applications uh, in things like methanol and metal uh, processing. And in a second, we'll talk about it. if you just watch those bars and how they might grow, uh, you'll see kind of how the market might change over time. Uh, on the next slide, you'll start to see how the um, hydrogen might play a role in industrial decarbonization as a fuel, as an integrated um, uh, feedstock, uh, or as an integrated heat and uh, feedstock source, and then um, it, as continuing as a feedstock. So hydrogen is really <clears throat> well suited as a replacement, uh, particularly in industrial high temperature heat applications uh, for which electricity uh, may not be a good substitute. Um, and so while there are some additional uh, decarbonization strategies in things like cement or aluminum or glass, um, hydrogen could be um, the, uh, the best alternative in some of those opportunities. And similarly, in, in steel production, uh, steel is a very, as I mentioned, is a hard to abate sector and so um, the current technology, which uses blast, a blast furnace and an oxygen furnace, that um, is a very difficult um, uh, process to decarbonize and hydrogen probably wouldn't work. Uh, but as we start to think about moving towards uh, newer technologies, such as direct uh, uh, reduction in arc furnaces, uh, there could be a role for hydrogen to reduce emissions from natural gas or coal. And then finally, in, um, in feedstocks, simply replacing uh, gray hydrogen with either blue or green in oil refining and ammonia production. And then perhaps looking at new synthetic methane production, uh, converting methanol to gasoline, as I think one of the other speakers has mentioned, uh, those could be additional applications for feedstocks. So as you can see, hydrogen could be a kind of a Swiss army knife uh, in the industrial sector for thinking about decarbonization. And if you look at the next slide, and start to think about how that might play out in terms of how this market might grow. You can see the growth of potential. And again, these are just not um, markets that we know will happen. This is sort of um, the available market size. So you can kind of see it growing from the 11 uh, million metric tons to perhaps as, as high as 43 million metric tons at some point in the future. And these numbers were taken from the um, NREL study uh, the technical and economic uh, feasibility study that NREL did, as well as some work uh, that the uh, resources for the future has done. So I've combined a couple of different data sources uh, to come up with this this um, this estimate. And then on the next slide, if you compare that market, that 43 million metric tons, to uh, other applications um, that NREL has looked at and their technical and economic potential. Uh, H2 at scale study, you can get a sense of the size of the industrial market compared to some of the other markets that we've been talking about today. So um, while the industrial market is going to be um, a difficult market and will take some time, uh, I think it could be a very um, uh, important market. And on the next slide, I think that the Gulf Coast in particular, and we've seen this slide before, it is very well positioned uh, to be a leader in this. And I think this is one of the things that we get excited about the Center for Houston's future is um, thinking about, um, you know, decarbonization as an opportunity for the Gulf Coast region that um, as we start to move into the energy transition, uh, Houston and the Gulf Coast region and really the whole entire state of Texas is really well positioned uh, given the resources, given the skills, uh, given the physical assets that we have to take advantage uh, of the energy transition. And that's, I think, an important uh, mindset that we need to start thinking about, about how we can really be a leader um, and take advantage of this um, and not be a hindrance to, um, uh, to moving forward on, um, uh, on these uh, in de in, uh, decarbonization strategies. So Arun, that, uh, Arun, that's basically um, uh, uh, the overview that I had for the industrial sector. Great, great. Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, let me let me pose a couple of questions uh, to all of you, but you know, begin by uh, asking a question to Jack. Uh, 
Uh, Tristan, now we can see your video. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Uh, Jack, a question for you. Um, you. You showed the timeline and you know, how you were thinking in terms of different phases and also you know, scoping in terms of you know, thinking about your emissions. As you look down two or three decades and as you, you know, think about your scope, of activities in terms of you know trying to mitigate the emissions um, broadening out to your users and intermediate users. What are the biggest uncertainties that you see uh, there? You know what what could really what keeps you up at night? If I if I might you know pose it that way. That's directed at me. Yes. No, nothing keeps me up at night. I think these things always get worked out. Um, like I said, I think the, the big challenge we have is that um, as, an, as a U.S. citizen, my, my, I'm concerned that this is done correctly because if you look at the foreign and, and domestic and direct investment that's happened in the last decade, I, had, I don't have the exact figure on top of my head, 70 or 80 percent of it was because of low energy price. And that's thousands of high paying jobs. Um, and we're if we do this right, we'll be able to retain that advantage. But today, 60% of China's energy comes from uh, coal. And they got this big gas line coming out of Russia. They're talking about converting uh, converting to uh, uh, a low carbon economy. It's much more difficult for them. Um, but uh, if you look at what's happened this winter, for example, with China uh, having the big cold spell, they had coal prices, get gas prices ran out the roof. We got we hit record LNG prices. Coal prices ran up, propane prices ran up. U.S. Gulf Coast, our prices stayed relatively low. It's a huge competitive advantage we have today. And my, if I have a concern, it's that we do this in such a way. We need to get there and um, get there as efficiently as we can. But it's going to take the wherewithal of the American public standing behind it. And if they're not willing to do that, we're not. We're, we're gonna, there's going to be a huge down spiral because we, we'll get started and we won't be able to afford to continue. It's just that simple. It, just to give you an idea of scale, I've never seen subsidies like we see in Europe. In Europe, they're talking. Uh, I think uh, I think Tristan talked about Pathos and Athos and the various projects that are happening there. The Dutch government's talking about bringing billions of dollars per project. You know, total is I think sixty-five billion dollars in the first wave. I mean, the U.S. has never ever subsidized at that scale. Germany also looking the same kind of numbers. And so the, if we're going to stay competitive, we're going to have to, you know, the U.S. government's going to have to get their mind around. This is the, the kind of scale of subsidy that's going to have to happen here. And all these things that we're spoken about today are simply not affordable from a competitive point of view. And, and if, we, if it's not, then what will it'll be fits and starts. We'll get started down a road and then we'll stop and then we'll get started and we'll stop and we'll lose jobs and we'll, you know, become uncompetitive. And so if something that keeps me up, it's that. How do we work together as industry and, and, and academia and government to come down a road that, that can be a continuous road where we can successfully get there? Um, and that's always difficult with um, vagaries of politics. Thank you so much, Jack. Those, those are you know, very important things to keep in mind. And as we also progress the discussion, including how policy and regulation uh, might play and will need to play uh, in, in all of this. Tristan, a similar question to you, just as with you know uh, Jack's operations, your work also entails global operation. You just mentioned your involvement, Exxon's involvement in projects across the world. What what do you think you know in when you look at Texas and when you look at things happening in the U.S. Where do you think uh, the the big lens needs to be put in and the big push needs to be put in from a policy perspective to really get things moving in how Jack put, you know, in a very committed, in a very uh, coordinated and, and forceful way. We really want to get this right. Yeah, thanks, Varun. I think, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, I mean, policy support, um, people talk about green and blue hydrogen, but let's just call it, let's just call it low carbon. Going to need policy support. Um, and sustain policy support, uh, and that's why you know we we, we talk about a, a carbon fee, um, a carbon price that's predictable, durable, um, and gives uh, industry the confidence to to 
bring those um, pricings into the economics of projects, which as you know, in our industry and related industries, projects have decades life, life, life um, uh, of, of, of duration. So it's that confidence in the durability of those uh, regulatory incentives, the clarity around standards. If you look at one, one of the topics that was touched upon a couple of times today was the potential to use existing natural gas infrastructure to transport hydrogen by blending. Uh, but if you move around different countries, even different states, there are different percentage limits, um, sometimes because of different pipeline designs and capabilities and ages and technologies, but also because different regulatory environments tend to come up with different standards. So there's some harmonization that's needed there as well. But I do want to come back to a topic you and I have talked about a lot, which is the great advantages of Texas uh, in studying energy and new ways and forms of integrating and using energy and new forms of energy or increasing forms of new energy, which is the ability to integrate all this existing infrastructure. So I think, uh, as I try to point out in my remarks there, these specific locations where you've already got some of the activation energy, if you like, behind you, you've already got infrastructure, you've got concentrations of users that are already producing and, 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 and deploying hydrogen. I mean, 100 million tons a year, it's a big industry today. It's a big industry with a lot of infrastructure. And I think the half of the, the UT project, which is looking at the greater Port of Houston area uh, at applications, starting with those areas where you've got perhaps lower barriers to entry and getting going, are the places to really get started to trial some of these new applications. Not the only place to start, but th those are places where, as we're seeing in, in various parts of the world, um, new applications for hydrogen are being trialed and discussed and researched. Great, thank, thank you so much, uh, Tristan. These are very, very important uh, times and what you're all able to do over the next uh, several years uh, will really uh, chart an important course. As Jack said, if we are able to really do this at scale or not, but, but I think you know there are lots of great opportunities there. Brett, before we move on to my closing remarks, let me pose a question to you. Uh, you know, for some of you might know and, and others may not, but you know, Brett was instrumental in deregulation of the Texas electricity market, you know, roughly 15, no, roughly 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yeah, over 20 years ago. Uh, you're in chairperson for the Texas PUC. And so in the fast forward 20 years, uh, Brett, you know, many of the things that, that the commission did when you were there, enabled this coming online of you know, a lot of wind and solar now that is you know central to discussion on green hydrogen and you just heard about you know there are, there are elements of cost and technology you know that still needs to be worked out and and yet you know you see hydrogen right smack in the center potentially of trying you know potentially being able to bring in the aspects of natural gas as aspects of renewable but really as Tristan said being able to use the entire uh, infrastructure skill base, if you will, around taxes. So, you know, what's what's your sense of, you know, how you, know, you and the center has done a lot of work on, on hydrogen and the human resource that, that's there in Houston. How do you think, you know, in addition to the infrastructure experience and so on, the ability and the people that we have, how does that, you know, uh, help us really take this uh, in a very serious way? Well, I, th I think, you know what we were successful in doing uh, 20 years ago is really building a a broad consensus for change, um, and, and we did it at the state level. And I think that's what we need to do. You know, um, for decarbonization, and 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 we're just not there yet. So, um, but but there are. I think you know. I think with this, uh, if nothing, if we take nothing away from today, is that this is really an opportunity for us, and we need to be thinking about that. Um, and then we need to be thinking about what those, not only what those policies are at the federal level, but what can we do at the state level? Uh, some of those things might be in the form of removing regulatory barriers, but they also might be in the form of incentives. You know, when we structured um, SB7, which was the um, deregulation bill, there was sort of something in it for everybody. There was something in terms of energy efficiency. There was something for renewable energy. You know, I, th I think we need kind of an SB7 uh, for de, you know, for thinking about decarbonization in Texas, where there are opportunities to start to build and experiment on each one of these. Because when we started uh, restructuring, you know, we had no idea that the wind industry in Texas was going to be 23 gigawatts. 
Uh, in fact, we couldn't even get the American Wind Energy Association to spend any time in Texas because they were too busy in California. And so you think about where all the um, the energy on hydrogen is going right now. It's going in California, but we know that Texas is going to be a bigger market um, for hydrogen at the end of the day, at least in terms of uh, in terms of the production of it, and maybe in terms of the applications. Um, and in fact, uh, the presentation that Joe Powell gave, I think, sort of indicates that Shell believes that this could be a, you know, that we could be a global leader in uh, the development and um, an export of hydrogen. So that that's really what we need to do is we need to bring all everybody to the table and start to create that sort of framework that we had for electric restructuring. If we can do that, then I think we can do some interesting things in the state. And it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be large at first. But it, but it, but I think if we can create that, as others have said today, then we can create the um, we can start to build a, a, a virtuous cycle just like we did you know, um, uh, for renewables. And that, that's really what we should be doing. Great, great. Thank you so much, Brett. And you know, thank you, Tristan. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Brett. This was a great session. We raised some really big issues and that will continue to inform the conversation as we move forward.